welcome to tonight's webinar. Thank you for being here as one of our many guests joining us from across the country. My name is David Hunt. I lead our education and research program here at Cardis. If this is your first time at a Cardis webinar, uh, let me give a one-sentence introdu introduction to who we are. Uh, Cardis is, is a nonpartisan think tank dedicated to clarifying and strengthening through research and dialogue the ways in which society's institutions can work together for the common good. And tonight's topic is education fallout, learning loss, collateral damage, and recovery in Canada schools post-pandemic. Uh, this event, of course, coincides with today's launch of, of a new Cardis research paper, Pandemic Fallout, by Dr. Paul Bennett. And the research is now available on our website, cardis.ca. And my uh, colleague, Carol, I think she just might have posted that uh, in the link, uh, posted the link to the report in the chat, excuse me. So please do click that link, check it out. Uh, you can download it for free from our website. Now, the goal of tonight's discussion is we, we want to keep it uh, keep it to, to just an hour. Um, and there's many things that, that uh, Dr. Paul, uh, many points he'll raise that will spark questions. So please, as, as you have ideas, type them into the chat. There's an icon, a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen there. Type your questions as, as you think of them in the chat. And as soon as Paul's done his presentation, uh, we'll do our best to, to address as many of those questions as possible. Of course, the sooner you get your question in, the more likely it is that, that your question uh, will be answered. Um, and I, I think we'll have a quite a robust discussion. Last time uh, we did a webinar with Paul Bennett, we, we didn't have time to get to all of the questions. So please, please, if you have a question, get it in early. Now, if I may introduce Dr. Bennett, he is the director Paul Bennett is the director of the Schoolhouse Institute. He's also an adjunct professor of education at St. Mary's University, based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He, he built a, a distinguished uh, teaching and education leadership career, uh, but he now roams at large as one of Canada's leading education policy researchers and commentators. Uh, earlier in his career, uh, he was twice recognized for his teaching excellence. He's he's produced three nationally recognized uh, Canadian history textbooks, one, one of which is on my shelf. Uh, he, he's also uh, served he, as, a, as a public school trustee, and he headed two of Canada's leading independent schools. Uh, and since September of, of 09, he's written four books. He's written 16 policy research uh, papers for various think tanks and research institutes. Uh, and his latest book, uh, the State of the System, A Reality Check on Canada Schools, is also on my bookshelf, an excellent book that I would highly recommend. It was it, it's, it was published during COVID, so the research is right leading up to that moment. An excellent book on, on the state of the education system in Canada. And for the past six years, Paul has been uh, the National Coordinator for Research Ed uh, in Canada, an excellent organization. And, and twice in recent years, uh, his, his blog, Edu Chatter, has been recognized as a top education blog in Canada. So it we're in for a treat. Uh, uh, Paul will have a lot to give us tonight. But again, get ready with your questions. And with that, I'm going to welcome to our virtual stage, Dr. Paul Bennett. Well, good evening, uh, David. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. You've blown me up quite a bit. I hope I don't disappoint your audience. I want to thank, first of all, Cardis, and particularly David Hunt, who was the editor of this project. It began about a year ago, and we have been working on it since. And I want to assure everyone that's watching tonight that Cardis does conduct independent research and gave me quite a bit of freedom to uh, explore a very important topic. And the topic, of course, for tonight's presentation is uh, the... I'm going to share my screen here is education fallout, as David has said, learning loss, collateral damage, and recovery in Canada's schools post-pandemic. What it doesn't say, and it might, is that we are very concerned about the state of education insofar as it affects the pandemic generation. So that is the subtext to everything we're going to be looking at tonight. Just see if I can get it to move here. It was, believe it or not, nearly four years ago that the first uh, signs of COVID hit us, to be exact, on March the 14th, 2020. This report tackles, in many ways, uh, the 
a background there. I'm going to go back here. <laughs> it's working now. Uh, three and four important questions we're going to be looking at tonight. How much learning loss have students suffered and how can we respond? How did the pandemic impact uh, students' social development and mental health? How is the response of schools different across the educational spectrum? And how can we do things better the next time? Those are big questions and ones that I want to spend a little bit of time trying to answer today. Let's start with the staggering impact of the pandemic, because when you think back to uh, what happened and how we uh, managed to endure this, I'm sure everyone that is viewing this tonight remembers the grim days of March of 2020. And this really swept the world, as everyone knows, from February to the end of March. And it affected 1.38 billion students around the world affected by school closures, including 5.7 million in Canada. Um, and it's about those students and our schools that tonight's focus is on. I think most people uh, in the audience would have seen or been aware of the research of the Ontario Science Table because this particular map uh, illustrates just how the impact played out from province to province across Canada. While it was uneven, um, British Columbia had nine weeks of school that were canceled between March 14th and May 15th, 2021. And Ontario, it shows at 19 weeks. Before it was all had said and done over 16 months, Ontario racked up about 25 weeks of missed school time and uh, other uh, provinces somewhere less than that. The average was about 20 to 22 weeks of missed school or about 130 days of school. That's a huge chunk of time for kids in our school system to be at home and in, in deflect, deflected into an alternative form which we call emergency home learning. What happened? Well, we're beginning to get a closer uh, sense of what actually happened because it was a numbing period and a lot of people, including those in charge of our school system, were struggling to find their bearings. But just this latest uh, data from UNICEF 2023 illustrates just how much it impacted students in Canada. Let's take a closer look at the 40 nations shown here in terms and ranked according to the number of days lost for school closures. And yes, you see Canada, Romania, Mexico, Chile, and the United States. Students were out of school longer in those jurisdictions than anywhere else. And of course, that is why we've got what we call today the lingering effects of COVID, long COVID in the educational world. What happened? Well, my report goes into a great deal of detail. It's full of data and uh, lots and lots of research, but I wanted to summarize it very briefly for you right on this slide. Learning loss is real and a substantial learning deficit arose early in the uh, pandemic. And what we know from late, the latest research is it's persisted over time. It hasn't narrowed. The gap is still about what it was uh, in the early stages. It's widespread, it affects students from the elementary grades through high school, and it's more pronounced in mathematics than in reading. We probably can guess that mathematics is more teacher uh, directed than reading. And that is where the greatest deficits are in mathematics. Children with special needs suffered the most, as did those who are marginalized in our school system. Early on, uh, research uh, indicated that 200,000 Canadian students went missing from school at the height of the first wave of infections. And that, that has been substantiated since. Uh, lower income families were disproportionately affected, increasing the knowledge gap between students from affluent households and those from disadvantaged households. Smaller and more autonomous schools, we believe and we've documented, fared better and provided more consistent, mostly uninterrupted learning. But I think it's fair to say no one emerged unscathed, and that is students, teachers, families, and schools. Why is this report focusing so much on learning loss? 
Uh, there's a very good reason, and that is because the, the single most important study conducted in Canada by the Royal Society of Canada, released in August of 2021, really did a good job assessing the psychosocial impacts on children and teens. That was very much the focus of the research team, and it was led by Tracy Viancourt of the University of Ottawa. That report essentially laid down a new dictum, which has been followed since then. Schools should be the last to close and the first to open. And that's because of the impact of school closures on students at all grade levels. When you dig deeply into that report, only one study within that report focused on learning loss. And it found that not one jurisdiction in Canada conducted seasonal student assessments to diagnose this all essential, pro all essential problem. So uh, this is where we come in with this report, doing a much more thorough look at learning loss as a centerpiece of the impact of the pandemic. Uh, one of the fundamental issues that arises is we just don't have the public data on how students were doing. And we were very much in the dark. Here's a quotation from uh, 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 Kelly Gallagher McKay, which illustrates it. I won't read it for you, but we simply suffered through what is called data starvation. And that has prevented us from dealing at specifically with the problem and targeting uh, recovery strategies. So the challenge that we had with this report was trying to piece it all together uh, to actually find from disparate sources and make sure that we were uh, covering everything. Now, school lockdowns upset the lives of 5.7 million Canadian students and their families, as all of you know. Students acting, um, acting uh, schools acting mostly, as we know, on the basis of public health directives, they struggle to provide a modicum of continuous learning. And um, essentially what happened was public health authorities took charge of school systems and schools were kind of uh, last in line and uh, neglected as a result of some of those decisions. Uh, what we have as a result of all of this is a new form of long COVID, a substantial overall learning deficit affecting the entire pandemic generation of school children. And there's documented evidence emerging more and more all the time that learning loss is was an undiagnosed problem in Canada, and it is clearly an understudied research topic. There were costs involved in flying blind. That is, we had produced little aggregate data. We were excluded uh, from most global studies of the pandemic's impact on learning. And provincial education authorities, school district superintendents, and university-based researchers were actually very slow to come to terms with the crisis. Many, many were focusing on a strategy of building back better, imagining a new world, thinking that uh, school transformation was what was going to happen. And by and large, they minimized the importance of learning loss. And we're beginning to see that that was very costly to us as a school system. Um, one of the things that cost us dearly, I think, was the suspension of assessment of students and the uh, relative lack of data. Since large scale assessment research was suspended or limited during the pandemic, and by the way, other countries and jurisdictions continued to test and assess students, they were trying to ascertain how bad it was and how, how enduring the damage might be. But uh, that being the case, we had, for most jurisdictions, suspended all forms of assessment. International, national, and provincial assessments were adversely impacted. Uh, assessment programs did occur, and, and, and when they did, there were high levels of non-participation impacting the sampling designs. So without the benefit of any aggregated student data, we are left to piece together the pandemic's impact on student achievement. And that's what this report does. It, it assembles uh, meticulously all the research that is currently available on the impact on student achievement. Let's take a look at the uh, differences among the various school sectors in the education system. Public school systems are large, mostly for the most part inflexible. They proved that again during the pandemic. And for the most part, they were caught completely off guard. And what we've discovered and most researchers have concluded is that they were 
rather ineffective in their pivot to uh, online learning or alternative forms of instruction. Smaller and more autonomous schools uh, have definitely perform much better. Enrollment changes uh, occurred during the pandemic as a result of the fallout. There was a near doubling in homeschool population. There was strong growth or su sustained growth among independent schools. And there was clearly lost school children, some of whom are now lapsing into um, chronic absenteeism while they've re-enrolled, they're not completely engaged in school. What this all means is that the COVID-19 education disruption was not short-lived at all, and students did not bounce back. Parental worries about learning loss and teachers' concerns about widening inequalities, they were voiced regularly, and they appear to have been justified as the research is beginning to show. We need to uh, conduct further and deeper research into the damage affecting children and teens, and that is what this project sets out to do, and I would encourage others to follow in that path. Now, looking across the education spectrum, from uh, the public school system to uh, private and independent schools, to home schooling and uh, other forms of alternative provision, we can see that uh, the pandemic fell uh, unevenly on students in each of those systems. Let's be fair about this. Public school schools have a much broader mandate and a heavy responsibility. And that is to educate all children wherever they live and from every segment of society. That's difficult and challenging in normal times, let alone during a global crisis and during shutdowns. So let's be fair in our assessment here. During such crises, the media also tended to focus on mainstream public schools and essentially reduced alternatives like private schools and independent schools or homeschoolers to rather crude stereotypes, which we try to address in our report. Shining a light on alternative responses provides a few possible lessons and maybe um, those are worth uh, replicating in other school uh, jurisdictions. When we shine a light on uh, the pivot in public schools, you inevitably are drawn to the largest school district in Canada, the Toronto District School Board. And um, we do have lots of scrutiny of that board. It's the largest school board. It exemplified in many ways the problems writ large affecting public school systems from coast to coast. The transition and the rollout of remote home learning was an unmitigated disaster according to a, a widely publicized article in Toronto Life in August of 2020. Um, I think that represents a fair assessment of the first phase of the uh, alternative, the pivot to a different form of instruction. The ministry stepped in, set minimum expectations, but there was no mention of providing continuity of learning through synchronous instruction, use of regular video uh, uh, instruction with kids, and um, many of that, uh, those initiatives were resisted by teachers with the support of the unions. Um, this pattern was reflected and re repeated elsewhere. When we look at, um, at the, uh, the academic pivot and, and the pivot in Ontario independent schools, we can take a look at a, a very, very good piece of research from CARDIS, uh, the pandemic pivot report in June 2021, which compared what were the expectations of kids in Ontario public schools with what happened in advanced affiliate schools, a small, um, smaller schools associated with an association in Ontario and Prince Edward Island. And when you look at what was expected, you'll see the minimum expectations that the Ontario Ministry of Education had for uh, schools per, per hours per day and uh, ranging uh, through the grades with increasing uh, expectations, but they're relatively minimal. And when you compare the uh, affiliate schools, the uh, Ontario independent schools with the mainstream schools, you'll just see how much more was expected of the students during the initial phases of the pandemic. This is abundantly clear from this uh, chart here. Uh, another factor which is really important was uh, the test of how much direct instruction and how much actual teaching was going on uh, can be seen through the amount of synchronous learning that was going on. 
And in much of the public school system, there is resistance to introducing synchronous learning as a, as a poet, and because uh, video instruction required teacher presence, and it was actually um, more demanding in, in terms of attentiveness of kids and parents. And so you'll notice a big difference here. There's far more emphasis in the Ontario independent schools on synchronous learning, and they provided far more in that form of instruction. And that is one of the, the key strengths of the system. So uh, essentially, what were the strengths of Canadian independent schools? They shone during the first phase of the pandemic, for sure. They're smaller schools, so they have advantages, mostly 100 to 400 students. Uh, the parents uh, work closely with the teachers. Everybody was in it together. Community members did whatever they, they felt necessary to ensure learning continuity. There was a more reciprocity between parents and uh, teachers in those schools. And um, independent school enrollments grew um, during the pandemic. Most of the evidence suggests that students receive more teacher instruction, experience fewer cancellations, and the private schools use video conferencing more effectively to maintain a sense of shared community. I think those things are borne out through the research. With respect to homeschooling, in the United States, there was something that was coined, a phrase co coined called the COVID bounce. There was an out-migration of um, families and students to homeschooling during the pandemic, the first year in particular. And I wanted to see if it was it applied in Canada. We do have Statistics Canada data that shows that essentially homeschooling enrollment doubled during the uh, first year of the pandemic from 83,000 um, to 83,784 students from 40,608 over the course of 2020, 2021. And that's the, the most reliable data we have. Most of the homeschool enrollment was concentrated in the lower grades, grades one and two. Uh, we do have a, a study that was conducted by a uh, homeschool association, National Homeschool Association, of seven reporting provinces. The homeschooling share of uh, K to 12 students uh, grew uh, not dramatically, but uh, significant enough to warrant not uh, notification. Uh, it was 2.5% uh, of total enrollment in those seven provinces in 2019 and 20, rose to 4.3% of enrollment in 2020-21, and it dropped back a little bit to 3.8% of enrollment in 21-22. But what's most significant is about 71% of the students stuck with homeschooling post-pandemic. Homeschooling has been growing uh, during the past few years as illustrated in this particular bar graph. And you can see that there's been a, a slow but steady growth of, of homeschooling. We would expect that the next data, which will be produced a year from now, will show just how much it's grown as a result of the pandemic disruption. I'd like to now turn to uh, away from the analysis. There's plenty of that in the report. After all, it is about 36 or 38 pages. To look at uh, a diagnosis of, of what went wrong and some possible prescriptions, uh, some constructive approaches to uh, avert this happening again or to recover what was lost in terms of learning and student uh, uh, social development. Uh, I, th I very much uh, appreciate uh, the comments of uh, on TVO on the agenda of uh, Dr. Prachi uh, Srivastava uh, in uh, January of uh, 2022. It was a, quite a good show on uh, the pandemic and uh, how well prepared we were. And she uh, made a very telling comment. I'm shocked at the lack of planning, at the lack of forward planning in the face of what is quite a quite predictable outcome. I would say that my report supports entirely that assessment that we were not prepared, we were caught off guard, and we did little to collect the data we needed to manage, assess, or respond to the impact of the mass school closures. Um, and none of the provinces and territories allocated sufficient funding to prepare for post-pandemic recovery. There were recovery plans across the 13 
provinces and territories. But if a close examination of them by authorities, by CBC and others, revealed that they were full of holes. Here's a telling comment in a report uh, out of uh, Wilfrid Laurier University written by Kelly Gallagher McKay and, uh, and Cider. Um, we were a laggard in, econo in educational recovery, little research, less action. Uh, other countries invested far more than Canada in learning recovery and started sooner. Everything I've learned and everything in my report supports the wisdom of that statement. Well, where are we now? And uh, how can we close the learning got, uh, loss gaps? As time goes on, it's obvious that there's a substantial learning deficit. The most recent data that was produced in July of 2023 shows that um, in reading and math, there's still a lot of um, kids are so far behind where they would have been. And the gap is just as wide as it was uh, in the early phases of the pandemic. I won't go through this data, except to say that when you go through the with a fine tooth comb the report, you'll see plenty of an analysis of the impact on learning and concrete evidence that learning loss continues and that the gaps are just as wide as they were at the earliest phases of the pandemic. Let's turn a moment to what the report tries to do. It, it tries to turn from uh, diagnosis to prescriptions, looking at learning recovery initiatives. We all remember the, uh, the, the, the phase of learning recovery that each province and territory engaged in after the initial phase had, had come to an end. And there were three immediate responses. Revamp the entire K to 12 curriculum to facilitate students catching up. Focus on the core competencies of reading and literacy as well as pro-social skills to make up for the gaps in social development and initiate targeted interventions, including intensive tutoring and summer catch-up sessions. Now that was a distillation of research uh, conducted uh, globally, uh, most of it uh, originating with McKinsey and company, a 2020 synthesis of, of international research, but many others continue to, to uh, emphasize that. I just wanted to give you one learning recovery plan and you'll see how broad they were and how they weren't focused or targeted enough. Uh, you can look down the plan here for Ontario and you see it, it addressed a lot of things and not, not essentially the learning loss. It was far broader and some of these particular elements um, really didn't uh, target the actual problem. And uh, there was lots of resistance, which I'll go into in a minute. Pandemic fatigue set in. And just looking at this classroom, you can see what it's like in a regular classroom for most teachers and how exhausting it was after the pandemic. So there was pandemic fat fatigue that set in. It definitely compromised and eroded many of the school level learning recovery initiatives. Recovery plans encountered stiff resistance at the school level and at this district level where uh, people were tired, they were um, looking to shorten the amount of time that they were in school rather than extend it. And most initiatives I have gathered and most researchers have concluded um, uh, petered out as teachers were burned out and students were either not interested in committing to summer school or they were not committed to it and there was no real uh, and compulsion to do so. So a lot of that was a disappointment and we need to face those realities and it, it we have to do better the next time. Um, taking a broader view, um, learning recovery initiatives are worth undertaking, but we are going to have to tap into research and strategies that we can glean from elsewhere. The best that I found was uh, Prachi uh, Shrivastava's report which she uh, produced uh, for um, the World Bank and uh, UNESCO, uh, which I think has a lot that can be applied to our current situation. And we need to take a much more crisis sensitive approach to pandemic education policy planning and recovery. And it needs to have four key considerations, managing a crisis and instituting first responses, planning for interrupted reopening with appropriate measures, 
sustained crisis sensitive planning with considerations of assessing risks for the most vulnerable amongst us and adjusting existing policies and strengthening the policy dialogue. That sounds like a lot of verbiage, but it, it essentially uh, says we need a plan. It's not enough just to close the schools and assume that everything will be fine and will return to normal. Collective planning exercises with cross-sectoral collaboration and community engagement are essential. And what we've learned is that a lot of the decisions were made by public health and municipalities and uh, school boards were trailed afterwards and were an afterthought. That can't happen again if we put a priority on what's best for the social development and education of our, our youth. Um, marginalized groups should be part of this rather than an afterthought as a sustained uh, and important part of pandemic recovery planning exercises. Um, I like this chart, not because it's complicated, but because I think it has a lot for us to unpack. When you begin to look at implementing recovery changes and recovery plans, any educational change, effective implementation is important and so is sustainability. And I always like to refer to the layers the provision of support, the financing on a continuing basis. How is it regulated? How is it being monitored? And who's managing it and with what results? One of the things we learned through this process is we can do a far better job at not only addressing, but implementing changes and ensuring that they're sustainable. There's much to be said for the approach outlined in this particular uh, infographic. In conclusion, um, long COVID is still with us in education, and a lot is at stake. Education's long COVID threatens Canada's international reputation as having one of the world's best school systems. It's obvious to everyone outside of Canada that we really didn't do a very good job managing the pandemic. We weren't present in doing studies. We didn't contribute to international uh, projects uh, and uh, in a meaningful way. And there was so little data coming out of Canada, we're not part of any of the international studies. Public health directives shutting down schools, there were lapses in post-pandemic planning and recovery efforts. They delivered uh, significant setbacks, most clearly reflected in the latest round of international, national and provincial student assessments. Canada's taken a, a, a real hit and our students are um, going to pay a price for the decisions that were made during the pandemic. Um, there's, we have a real concern about the quality of education. It's critical to our nation's productivity, health, adaptability, and innovation. And we need to have the resilience, a resilience in that system that's required for our students to thrive in a competitive global society. In sum, I just want to summarize what the real impact is, a substantial learning deficit, it's going to affect the lives of the current generation of students for years to come, not just their capacity to perform well in the next stage of their education or in the workplace, but their incomes are going to be impacted as a result of some of the effects of this particular uh, catastrophic event. Consistent, reliable and evidence based data is needed, critically needed, if we were to effectively respond to the full range of the pandemic's longer term impacts on children, teachers, and families. I am here tonight asking and, uh, and recommending a new Canadian education research agenda. That needs to happen. We need to tackle pandemic learning loss and denialism. We need to track student progress, and we need to work harder at getting students back on track. They're all of uh, vital and immediate strategic importance because we're still, believe it or not, uh, four years on, engaged in a recovery mission, and there's no room for complacency. Those are the biggest lessons of the pandemic education fallout, not only for uh, teachers, but educational policymakers, school district uh, leaders, parents, and families. And that is the message I bring to you tonight. Uh, and I want to thank you for your attention. These are some of my resources, many, many more in the report. And I'd like to invite you to continue the conversation, not only tonight, but uh, in future with me. I'm very easy to find, and here's how you can connect with me.
in the days and months ahead. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. So if you have questions, please uh, plug your questions into the Q&A icon down below. We'll, we'll try our best to get to all of them the, the, in the limited time we have left. Now, um, if I could start uh, the, the Q&A, Paul. So re re reflecting on, on our presentation here, what stands out most to me <laughs> is the data starvation. Like there is just so like, so for those of you who haven't downloaded the report yet, the link to the report is, is in the chat. Carol will put it there. There's nine pages of references. Uh, like this is, if I'm not mistaken, the most comprehensive literature review on what research has been conducted on the pandemic in Canada. And yet there's, there's so like, it's we mining through all of that. It's there's, there's so many key metrics that we don't have. So for example, in the United States, pre-COVID, just before COVID, absenteeism, chronic absenteeism, was, sat around about 15%, um, and, and that was stable for a number of years in a row, roughly 15%, it's different in, in different states, different jurisdictions, but it's pretty steady. Okay, that now has doubled to 30% chronic absenteeism, and in places like Arizona, Washington, D.C., New Mexico, Arkansas, you're now at just shy of 50%. So half of students are regularly not showing up for class. That's the American data. Now, if we look at, of course, homeschooling, as you pointed out, what's happened in Canada is very much mirrored in, in the States, the spike that you saw, so the double homeschool enrollment that happened in the US that happened here, and then the retention of 70%. Again, you see that in the States, you see that here. So in terms of absenteeism, I guess my simplest question is, where is that data? Uh, does that data exist for Canada? Uh, and then, and then, secondly, do do you think it would mirror what's happening in the states? And if that data doesn't exist, because I assume that's what your answer is going to be, because I haven't been able to find it, uh, why why don't we have that data here in Canada? You just asked the question that torments every serious education researcher in Canada. Why is it that we do not have the metrics we need to do a, an a thorough and effective and comprehensive job of analyzing something. That example you gave is perfect. For example, student absenteeism. We do not have baseline data uh, within uh, provinces, let alone across the country. The US study that you just referred to, they had baseline data for most of the states in the union before the pandemic, so they can they can actually track the impact of the pandemic. We don't have that. What we have is, and I know because I've done uh, individual soundings and studies in New Brunswick, Ontario, and other provinces. And what we have is fragmentary results over certain limited periods of time where we know there were blips in absenteeism, but we don't have a, a whole lot of data. Now there's uh, er all kinds of other areas. Uh, school violence is a bit of an exception because we're starting to get more data now as a result of the threats and the safe uh, school initiatives of the teachers unions. They've been very effective in getting more data out there on school violence and the effects on kids. So, so there's data there and there's increasingly comprehensive data. But again, we don't have a national education uh, uh, department. We don't really have any substantial coordination of any of the data. We uh, lost the uh, the uh, Canadian Council on Learning, which was a national body that did aggregate data and fill in the holes. And we've lost an awful lot over the last 12 or 14 years because we were making progress in building uh, data sets and a basis of comparison. So uh, one of the frustrating things that all researchers who are serious about addressing problems in Canada face is the problem you identified, yeah. data starvation. There's another issue. Most of the researchers in our faculties of education and in uh, those involved are really qualitative researchers. There's not a whole lot of quantitative research going on. I can tell the audience tonight, though, that there is a new study that's underway headed by Tracy Biancor and a core group of academics with more capacity to do that kind of quantitative study. And with any luck, about six months from now, there will be a much more comprehensive report. But I think it's going to mirror in many ways what you're seeing tonight 
uh, on this presentation and with our report. Yeah, no, that's very good. Okay, Jamil uh, Giovanni asks, and this this segues well. You were talking about how we don't have a, a national. Uh, the, the federal government hasn't had much of a role in education historically. So Jamil asks, how can the federal government uh, be helpful? The role of provinces and school boards is obviously clear, but surely the federal government must have a role in addressing the impact of school closures and education inequality. What can the federal government do? Well, we have the Council of Ministers of Education. That's the only body that currently exists that coordinates in any way K to 12 education. Uh, it's a body that consists of the ministers of education and the deputy ministers. So there's potential there for it to become a more serious body. What the issue is, is as everyone who's watching knows, education is a provincial responsibility. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of structuralists that say that the, the federal government shouldn't be involved. Now, however, the federal government is involved in health, establishing uh, minimum standards, the Canada Health Act. So you could argue that in a crisis, there have to be standards. There has to be some clarity around um, what's expected and uh, beyond a certain point when the uh, children of the nation are actually being harmed. So I, I think there's there's more support now for this. I'm, I'm a big supporter for a national research institute that would conduct the research and would shine light on this problem. There are a lot of us who would uh, would be very pleased to join a national research institute yeah. so that we could do pan-Canadian assessments and we'd have the best and the brightest people uh, yes. put to work to improve our education system. Yes, absolutely. No, thank you for that response. Okay, Dr. Uh, Jim Christopher asks uh, two questions, but the first one I think you can answer very quickly, so I'll sneak in both. Um, research here in British Columbia, where, where I am based, shows that First Nations and students with special needs uh, showed the lowest graduation rates in June of 2020. What they didn't show was that these results were consistent with past performance. So did COVID just reinforce disparities? COVID worsened and deepened the disparities that existed. Yeah. There are very, very few exceptions to that general statement. And I think that's a, that's a subtext to the entire report. Yeah. Uh, what the report shows is that everyone suffered uh, losses in learning, but more so among those that had a disadvantage to begin with. So yeah. that's the answer, I think, to that okay, specific then, question. Okay, and then another direction, um, the nation's report card in, in the States uh, showed a performance drop at all grade levels in literacy and numeracy with the greatest differential in students who were already low performing. So were these uh, were these typical results? And what were the results yes. in Canada? What I found is our results track very closely with most of the American results. Um, and that's, of course, how you can do research in Canada. I think it's rather sad that we have to go and take U.S. examples. For example, yeah. the, uh, you know, the um, Northwest Education Association uh, in uh, in the West Coast there is solely responsible for generating all the data on learning loss. It's all their forecasts, it's their analysis, and we've been kind of living off their forecasts and essentially looking, taking their general conclusions and hypotheses and trying to see whether they apply in the Canadian context. And for the most part, they do. Um, and I think there's some value in that, but we shouldn't be just replicating research that's being done in the United States. Yeah, no, fair point. Paige, Paige McPherson asks, uh, Paul, this is an excellent contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Paige, for that. Uh, your important work on missed uh, classroom time predates the pandemic. Among other things, it seems to me kids need to be in class more to get back on track. Uh, what can we do to achieve this? Summer school, strictly enforced virtual learning on incremental weather days, uh, anything else? Uh, and is this uh, likely to be embraced? I'm less optimistic about that than I once was because I think we've been through a, a torrent of change and uh, a lot of us are still suffering the, uh, if we're honest, we're suffering from the pandemic fatigue ourselves. And um, just to get the clarity on what the problems are and to address them. Now, um, learning loss has is compounded by all kinds of other things. And I think what Paige is getting at is kids are out of school for all kinds of other reasons. Uh, there's disruptions, there's violence, there are closures for um, inclement weather. And uh, what we've got is a school system that's essentially uh, interrupted constantly. 
and classrooms that have low levels of disruption virtually all the time. In fact, the OECD uh, estimated that uh, the average class in Canada has uh, about uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes between each disruption. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's very, very hard. We also have a huge challenge with the in, in, inclusion, uh, let's just say intrusion and dominance of um, social media and mm. uh, TikTok brain and all the associated mental health challenges. So I think that the uh, we need some clarity on uh, a new focus. I'm a big advocate for uh, student uh, behavior and an address. We need to address that. So, uh, change the culture of schools. I think there's there's a lot to be said for addressing the overall culture of schools and 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 doing so uh, addressing a lot of these interconnected um, problems. Okay, hey, follow up to that. A number of people asked uh, questions that if I could just package it most simply. <sighs> Moving forward. <laughs> Where should teachers, where should where should schools put their their time, their energy, their their, their resources in in terms of closing that learning gap? Uh, and are there particular approaches in the classroom or at the school level um, that that we know to be based on research uh, better than others? The focus should be on literacy and numeracy in the lower grades. That's absolutely essential, and I'm afraid to say that that that's important. I'm also a big advocate for. Um, reading comprehension and a knowledge building curriculum. I right. think it, now's the time to be looking at a knowledge building curriculum because an awful lot is missing and we need right. to put that back. I, I'm a big advocate of that. I, I'm also uh, keen on seeing us um, not just uh, engage in social promotion. And uh, I think we need to face squarely that these kids need more regular ongoing support to bring them up to the levels that are going to situate them and position them so they can do well in university and college or better than expected. Okay. So on that, the note of college, students who of course experienced the pandemic and are now in higher education, we, we can't turn black back the clock on them. So what measures would you recommend at the post-secondary level for instruction for instructors of those students? Well, I'm afraid it's, it's to, they should be, um, trying to provide them with the kind of structure and the kind of challenges that they may not have had. At mm -hmm. some point, they're going to have to challenge them. So I think um, I'd like to see, honestly, I'd like to see more exams. I'd like to see more rigor in the assessments. And I'd like to see a, a, this generation be challenged before they leave school and find that the workplace isn't quite as friendly or and as forgiving as maybe the school system was. So I think there's issues there. And universities, I think, should be stepping up and making sure that they uh, close the gap and ensure that there is more rigor in the program. Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, there's so many good questions here, and we are we are running out of time. Okay, let's let's take th this one's a bit of a, a twist. Um, was there any consideration given to the positive impact of COVID? on those students who benefited from being away from school settings, so say ASD students or, or students with social anxieties. What, what are your thoughts on that, Paul? Some students did benefit and they're a minority, um, but a significant minority. Some students have always found school very, very difficult. And uh, ironically, um, some of these alternatives, they found more to their liking. That's why you get um, you know learning pods um, continuing in some uh, situations. That's why some kids did better. One of the ironies is that many kids did better in reading. Their reading scores did not suffer as much, particularly in secondary schools where their parents expect them to read more challenging books. And they were asked to read things that ordinarily they wouldn't be asked to in school because they weren't bound by you know grade level readers and, and so yeah. on. And yeah. uh, the, the irony is that, that some of the, um, the more able students actually did better at, in their reading and uh, in in their academic achievement at the higher levels. But again, there are great variations. Uh, the vast majority of students yeah. suffered, but yes. there yeah. were uh, these discontinuities uh, when you look carefully at the results. Okay, Kent D Dijkstra asks about resistance to pandemic recovery plans. So you mentioned there was resistance. Um, can you elaborate on that? Who 
resisted uh, these plans and for what reasons? Well, there's a progressive consensus within elementary education, and that is uh, there's a real focus on progressive ideas of collaboration and cooperation. Uh, there's distrust of tests and exams, and uh, there's there's essentially a, um, a feeling that there should be less compulsion. That that's the nature of most elementary schools in Canada. So then when you get a, a pandemic and you get a crisis and there are people saying we need more direct instruction, we need to be more specific, we need to expect more of the kids because they did, they're did they missing so much. Uh, we need to think about, do they need to, uh, should they be in, in school in the summers? Should we extend the school year? All of this runs counter to the prevailing, I would say, uh, culture sure. in our, particularly our elementary schools. So there's a built-in resistance. Um, of course, uh, teachers' unions, they have a stake here. They they actually uh, are, have a stake in keeping the system the way it is. Uh, yeah. They don't want, uh, you know, longer hours. They don't, uh, they were quite nervous about the potential for online learning and when would the school day end and begin. It was all blurred. And they tried to define the school day in ways that meant the teachers um, actually themselves weren't going to burn out. So I think all of these things happened and they they there's a fatigue that set in. And I, I think the teachers unions very dug in their heels about how much extra work teachers were willing to put in after going through the pandemic. For all those reasons, yeah. most of those initiatives petered out. Um, one of the things I think that was a mistake, though, was so much emphasis on summer learning. And um, the research was based on summer learning loss. So a lot of the first reactions were, well, we need summer school or we need to extend the school year and so on and so forth. I've never been in favor of that. I think it would, it would have been better to build into a, a, an instructional day, more challenging activities and reorganize the schedules a little bit. I, I'm one who believed that there was a huge mistake to go to trimesters and to have long, longer periods. I think we should have gone shorter periods. And um, I don't think there would have been nearly as much learning loss. We had shorter periods with um, a specific emphasis on, I would say, more uh, teacher guided instruction. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I agree as well. Now, is there any qualitative information? This is Joseph Woodard asking. Any qualitative information of the extent to which provincial differences were the result of, of different levels of pro-closure activism on the part of uh, different public teachers unions? Ontario is the best example of that. There was a virtual labor war underway with the Ford government during the first phase of the pandemic. There were it was bad blood. There was, uh, if you recall, there was all kinds of, um, of antagonism over whether there would be um, online learning courses, whether they were going to be in the high schools, whether they were going to be. So the 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 whole atmosphere was poisoned. So I think there's, it's exaggerated in Ontario, but it appears elsewhere. There's also a consensus that um, educational jurisdictions want to work cooperatively with teachers. They don't want to be compelling them to do things. And so you're in a situation where you did have to compel uh, teachers to do things that they may not ordinarily have wanted to do. And so there's a limit to what you can do. There's also uh, labor contracts with um, uh, basically written by the teachers' unions, and they were still in force. One example might be Alberta, where they used what flexibility they had to say that uh, school would continue into March, uh, after March. And um, they, they actually um, insisted that in the guidelines that teachers be expected to actually deliver a certain number of hours of instruction. Everywhere else it was kids were expected to do a certain number of hours of instruction. So you know what happens then, it's left to the volition of kids and the parents. And that, that I think was a serious mistake. I think they should have been more explicit about how much was expected of the teachers and the students during the pandemic. Okay, so t dovetailing on that, Juliana asks, with the understanding that students facing marginalization are, are underserved and under-supported in the school system, despite the same potential as other students, how can these recovery initiatives you suggest better serve the students facing marginalization? I think some jurisdictions, and I, I think of um, maybe New Brunswick as an example. I'll give you an example, a concrete example. 
Some jurisdictions did differentiate between kids uh, who were severely learning challenged and ensured that there was more continuity of learning. And I noticed in some of the examples in, um, in uh, Scandinavia, for example, there was much more of an, an emphasis on identifying kids that were already struggling and ensuring that there was more continuity. So uh, I would say an answer to the question, a good one, is I think the next time we need to have more differentiation as to how we treat the various groups of students within the school system. Those that are, have severe learning challenges, those that are marginalized, I think we should have offered them and provided a more continuous uh, access to learning because they're, they're far more vulnerable and suffered far more as a result of this. So your point is a good one. And I would in, encourage um, policymakers to look at differentiated approaches. I think we learned over the, the time of the pandemic that one size doesn't fit all. Simply canceling universally all schools all the time was not a great idea. We need to be um, have a much more balanced and I would say um, I, I would say calibrated approach, which has different approaches for different communities within the school system, especially if it's going to go on and become uh, something that drags on for months on end. A okay, similar question, but I want to orient this one towards teachers. So Catherine asks, while you're discussing the impact um, to numeracy and literacy and recommend recommendations for catch up, K-12 teachers are absolutely exhausted supporting student emotional dysregulation that's completely out of control and significantly negatively impacting general classroom function. Do you have commentary to this and recommendations? And the way I would like to pivot this question is what would be your advice for teachers who are in that situation? My advice to teachers is start speaking up and continue speaking up about the difficulties you're having on a day-to-day -day basis in getting the cooperation of kids and the, the complexities of the classroom. You're going to find a lot of support from parents and certainly from students because they're finding it increasingly difficult to, uh, to function in a school. So teachers aren't alone. It's a common problem. And I'll give the same recommendation I generally do. I think it's a question of school culture. I think we need to revisit what we expect of students and what kind of behaviors that we expect in our school system. We need to reassess uh, re what we're doing and take a, a, a look at being, have it more purposeful, focused classrooms that support teachers. And I think ultimately it's going to be without cell phones because I think that's it clearly an issue that's arising everywhere it's yeah. it's a distraction yeah. and we need to establish uh, more habits of attention in the class teachers will be much healthier much happier if they have a much more cooperative and engaged student population it's mutual respect we want but um it won't come without a change in school culture okay now we're, we're pretty much out of time but let's sneak in just one more question uh what is your opinion on alternative education programs such as learning pods or homeschool cooperatives, as well as other options that are beginning to pop up as a result of dwindling confidence in a provincial education system or, or the facade of choice uh, in education the way it currently is represented. I'm gonna surprise you a little bit. Most of your um, viewers would know that I'm a big supporter of public education, a graduate of public schools myself. I believe the foundation of, this, of the school system is important in having a, a quality public education system, and that's been my fight. Having said that, I've always been in favor of alternatives within public education, expanding the range of options, making more of these options available. I think it would be a shame if we had uh, an atomized school system with uh, hundreds of these little uh, learning pods. Um, there'd be teachers um, teaching groups of five to 10, which is the learning pod model. I hope it doesn't come to that, I think um, it's it's a bit of a, a statement on how underserved certain groups of kids are, and there are the gifted, the intellectually challenged, the marginalized, not being served as well as they could. So you'll find me always uh, arguing for more choice within the framework of public education. Well, let a thousand flowers bloom. I love that. Good way to to, to tie this off. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bennett, for making time for this. Thank you to all of our guests for, for being here. Um, 
If you have follow-up questions, you can reach me at dhunt at cardis.ca, or you can reach Paul at edu-chatter on, on Twitter or X, whatever it's called these days. But edu-chatter is, is his Twitter handle. He's very active on Twitter. Send him a direct message. Uh, please download the report. The link is in the chat. It's also available on our web website, Pandemic Fallout. Thank you all, and to all, a good night.